And I'll speak a bit about cannabinoids on normal and abnormal movement, uh, its effects and modulation of normal and abnormal movement. Uh, speak a bit about the rediscovery of cannabinoids of, as treatment for movement disorders. The reason I say rediscovery is that uh, in 1888, there's a handbook of neurology or the, the manual of neurology by William Gowers, who is a, a giant of neurology in Britain in the 19th century. The standard two medications that were used were tincture of cannabis indica, soma drops four times a day, and along with belladonna alkaloids. Those are the two major treatments, and they continue to be used for a long time. So to, to reinitiate studies, um, to demonstrate that this approach works in slowness, rigidity, and tremor of Parkinson's disease, it's, you know, it, it works, there's no doubt about it. But to do it and, and the, to, to, dis, to use the, uh, the formulation that's, that would be most readily available and accessible and approved by regulatory agencies is the issue here. And, uh, of course, the, for me what's very exciting is the potential of cannabinoids as neuroprotective agents, and we'll speak a bit about that. And by that, it means we can impact on the illness by slowing the rate of progression, by uh, uh, delaying the onset of the illness. So that means that perhaps an individual is at risk for these disorders, and it's easy in the case of Huntington's disease, because we have a gene test that recognizes people at risk, and we might be able to initiate treatment at a very early age with agents that are, have very good therapeutic windows, in other words, no deleterious side effects, and they may delay the onset instead of 35 years of age as onset, but perhaps 50 or 40, where it would be a less severe illness and less debilitating. So here's, here's what I found extremely interesting. I, last year, oh, this is actually an older version. It's actually since 2003, not 1999 that there was a patent issued to National Institutes of Health with uh, Julius Axelrod, one of the Nobel Prize winners uh, for his seminal work on catecholamines, uh, was given to the, to the National Institutes of Health to, uh, based on their evidence that and their claim that these agents would be useful as neuroprotective agents and as antioxidants. But what always blew my mind is yet we have this message that these are not the message from the, uh, the enforcers, that these are not useful medical agents. But the inventors of this patent, and uh, I'm starting at the end. Remember I said I was going to speak on neuroprotection, and I'll save some of that towards the end. But I just thought that this, for me, is, is very exciting, that at least there's acknowledgment by uh, many of the scientific community and by the people who issue patents that these have tremendous potential as neuroprotective agents. And anyone who works with these chronic neurodegenerative diseases knows that all we have right now are agents to alleviate symptoms. And clearly, the cannabinoids alleviate some of these symptoms, but in addition, and this is something that has to be worked out, they may actually be extremely useful in changing the course of the illness towards one that is less severe Now, the way that they're neuroprotective, uh, and I'll just be very simple about this, is that both the tetrahydrocannabinol, daltonine, and the cannabidiol protect against glutamate excitotoxicity in vitro. And I should just mention that many of the uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and even um, post-ischemia or following stroke or head trauma, there is a cascade of events whereby glutamate is released in excessive amounts and glutamate triggers a whole cascade of oxidative stress that triggers then, ap uh, well, really a series of things of programmed cell death as well as oxidative stress uh, that results in dysfunction of neurons and their ultimate demise. And, and this is from the patent. I just thought, you know, this is published, this is from uh, 2003, October 7th it was issued. And if you look here, uh, you can see, I don't know if you can see the arrow here on the, uh, y-axis, this is LDH release, is a kind of an indicator of cytotoxicity. When a, a neuron is injured, it releases LDH, lac, uh, lactic dehydrogenase, it's an ubiquitous enzyme, and an injured neuron will release this into the medium. So it's a measure of toxicity. And if you add glutamate, this is an in vitro assay, 
and that's what you see, if I can find my arrow, here, glutamate, you see you get all this release of LDH. If you co-incubate with 5 micromolar THC, you get a 50% reduction of excitotoxicity. It also works with 5 micromolar of CBD, cannabidiol. So both of those constituents of marijuana are protective in vitro in, against an excitotoxicity model. And this is the kind of evidence presented by the inventors. And there's evidence in the published literature that's just like this. And I'm just not going to spend that much time on it, but what I have here is, uh, you'll notice throughout, I, I took this logo, caduceus, the symbol of medicine, which is a staff with snakes and wings sometimes, and it's an old Greek notion. You know, the, the venom from snakes had a, not only was it fatal at times, but it could be used as a medicine, just like pharmacology. In pharmacology, uh, dose determines the benefit versus deleterious effects. So, so in the old days, they would put people into a snake pit, and you know, somehow they would get over their disease. And now, I like this symbol a lot better than the, med the symbol of medicine, because it's kind of a scary symbol, a staff with two snakes. Kind of scary to, it, you know, it, it's almost like a cross, skull and crossbones, you know, which we put on medicines also, poison. So it's kind of a scary symbol. The symbol of cannabis and is a beautiful symbol. It's, you know, it's, so I like to bring them together. Well, this woman with the snake around her, to me, I'd like to see that. It's a little less scary. She's tamed, you know, it, it's just not so ominous. I like that to be the symbol of medicine. Uh, Pro-life, you see. And, and really, uh, we'll talk about it. So I want to go now into the role of the basal ganglia in the control of movement. And I use this in my lectures to medical students and residents, and it just relaxes them a bit because you don't, I said, don't pay attention to the details. Just look at this whole thing. So you'll understand where the basal ganglia are, and maybe we'll talk a bit about it. Let's see if we get this thing to run. So this is, uh, some, this is from the University of Washington, the digital anatomist. And the green thing there is the putamen and the globus pallidus. You see, and we could run it again, but I'll show it to you. And you'll see they're deep in the, in the, in the brain. And I just love seeing these things because, you know, it, it, the way we u were exposed to brain is by taking the, the postmortem tissue and cutting it like salami. And, but to see it in three dimensions like this is very, very clean. And I hated the smell of formalin. And here you see the putamen in three dimensions. So what you see that look like beautiful horns in blue is the ventricular system. And I tell my students, say, orient yourself by the hollow chambers of the brain which in medieval times was considered to be where the repository of the soul, where the vital spirits resided that involved in movement. So that's why I mention that, that they weren't too far off. We actually think of the automatic execution of learned motor programs as being mediated by these deep gray structures that line the ventricles. Ventricles are actually very important in terms of neurogenesis, but that's a whole other story. And I'll show you this one. I just wanted you to get an idea of the beauty of the brain uh, because we, in this audience, think of inner space, but we don't really think of the three-dimensional structure of the brain very often. The two other neurologists here are very, understand exactly what I'm talking about. In neurology, we say, where is the lesion? When we can't find the lesion structurally, then we assume it's a cellular molecular event. It's, for example, uh, a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We can never really see any structural deficit, so we have to go to a level of analysis that's beyond the limits of our resolution. And here is finally, there you saw solid structures. I, di I didn't even bother naming them for you because I don't think you need to remember this. I'm not going to test anybody, and that's what I tell the students. I'm not going to test you on this. Just appreciate the beauty of the structure of the brain. And I made a, a flash thing here to show, really, the sequence of these two major motor loops and this goes on and on, that result in either Parkinsonism. Here's the nigrostriatal system right here. This green thing, this is substantia nigra, projects dopamine to the putamen and caudate. That's distinct from the ventromedial mesolimbic dopamine system that mediates reward. That is the essence of reinforcement. Um, this nigrostriatal system, and you see I have little, um, it's both positive and negatively uh, modulates uh, striatal neurons. In Parkinson's disease, we've lost all these dopaminergic neurons. 